You can go ahead and turn and tie it. It's to chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 5 through 9 here in a moment. We need to learn that song, though, I was going to say. I, I wasn't real familiar with that one. It's really good, very good. But anyway, uh, Titus, we've started our expositions through the book of Titus. I'll read this text here in a moment. It's been said or, or set forth that your idea is what you wish to be, what we want to be. Your reputation is what people say you are. And your character is what you are. Now the question I asked on Wednesday night as a lead-in to this message for today was how important is character? Character, how important is it? By definition alone, it is obviously very important. It's defined this way, character, a distinguishing feature or attribute. The moral or ethical structure of a person or group, a moral strength or the moral strength or integrity, and then a reputation or reputation. These are all how it's defined. Proverbs 22, 1 tells us a good name is more desired than great riches. Your character. But just how important is character perceived in our society? Uh, our, our culture. Not, not the church culture per se, but the culture. Character is of little importance uh, in our culture, our society. Now, I'm not here... To, to beat dead horses that, that we, we seen play out politically. But the reality is, is that very little uh, emphasis, if you will, or little weight is put on the character of a person. Now, it depends on the political environment, how it works. And we see that happening and has happened in the past. The right sees a Moral failing and character is a huge issue. The left sees a moral failing and they take and seize the opportunity as well. But the reality is, is by and large, we really don't care about character. I remember growing up and I remember reading about George Washington who could not tell a lie. I remember about Honest Abe. And those stories about the leaders, the presidents of the past, and their character. We were taught it in school. Taught to esteem it. To think highly of these men for their character. Now in our modern, modern culture, I believe since the 92 uh, season, political season, where there was major uh, scandals surrounding candidates, presidential candidates, and we even have them with our current president. And depending on the, 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 the camp you happen to be in, that's no big deal or it's a big deal. But it's only because it works in their favor, not because it's a real issue at all. We were actually taught back during those elections that really it doesn't really matter. As long as they perform in the job, who cares what they did, who they are, and what they do? I don't care. Just let them do the job. Well... That's not very really <laughs> biblical as it relates to those who lead. Those who are called to be in positions of leadership. Character is who and what you are. It's what defines us. It's what people see. But not only see, but they see because that's what it is. That's who you are. So it is very important. This morning, character is the name of the game. It's the name of the game as it comes to leadership in the church. Praise God that He has set standards for leadership where character is everything. I mean, He, he, he lays this down, not only in Titus, but in 1 Timothy. And he actually deals with it over in Peter as well. But I want to read the text now, 5 through 9. This is where we find ourselves in the expositions of this letter. For this reason, I left you in Crete, 
that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he may be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. That's the text. Now, if you remember the theme of this letter that we're operating under, we've given this book, this, these three chapters, the book of Titus, the letter of Titus, this epistle, this controlling theme, provisional theme. The believer, as well as the church, the corporate body, is to live and conduct oneself or themselves so as to promote good deeds, glorify God, and silence the opposition. That's our theme. That's what this letter conveys. When you boil it all down, Paul writes to Titus, and the one thing that comes out is just what I stated as the theme. This morning we learn, though, that this theme, this, this truth that's asserted in the letter starts with proper leadership. Now I've already explained to you, you want to understand the ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, the, how, how churches are structured and governed and what they should look like. It's Titus and 1 Timothy. I mean, those are letters where Paul is talking to pastors or, or, or men, uh, young pastors, and he's telling them, this is what I want you to teach us, what the church ought to look like. This is what you ought to tell the young men, the old men, the young women, the old women. This is how it ought to go. This is what it ought to look like, and this is how it ought to be. And so we get a lot of our ecclesiology, our, our structure, our governance, understanding of how a church governs by these letters. The proposition here today, though, in keeping with this truth being asserted through the leadership, is this proper le leadership is essential in reaching the goal. Proper leadership is essential in reaching the corporate and individual goal of promoting good deeds, glorifying God, and silencing the opposition. Let me say it one more time. Proper leadership is essential in reaching the individual and corporate goal of promoting good deeds, glorifying God, and silencing the opposition. Now, the question is, is what makes a proper leader? What kind of guy should be in those capacities? Well, he didn't leave Titus. We're going to get to that in a moment. But he didn't leave Titus without instructing him. He's te he tells him. He gives him this letter. I'm sure he told him even before. But he gives him the letter. And I'll explain that in a moment. And he tells them what, this ought, what these guys ought to look like. Uh, if they're going to serve, these are the kind of guys that ought, to, that ought to be considered. These are the people. Not just considered, but these are the ones you want. These are the ones that should be leading. So in, in this portion now of the letter, Paul sets forth the qualifications for elders. The qualifications, though, are broken into three batteries. We'll call them three batteries, three segments here, three batteries. The first is a domestic battery, not violence here. <laughs> We're not talking legality. We're talking a, a, a grouping. A negative battery, what we must not or he must not be. And a third, the positive battery of what he must be. Okay, so that's what we're looking at. This morning we will be covering one. We're going to look at Titus's commission first. Titus's commission, and secondly, the battery, number one, uh, of domestic qualifications. It's domestic qualifications that we're dealing with. So let's go ahead here, let's get into the text, and we'll look first at Titus's commission. Look at verse 5. And I read again. For this reason, this is Paul writing to Titus, for this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. So, what we have here in, in, in 
what, 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 what this is about is we have Titus's orders in a written form. Paul s- sends a letter. And basically, this letter is going to give him his authority to do what he's calling him to do. It's establishing him. This is the Apostle Paul who now leaves t- uh, Titus in Crete and says, I want you to appoint elders in every city. So Paul obviously had verbally instructed Titus upon leaving him in Crete. Now I want to note several observations here that, that, that need to be made. Number one, he was left there. He was left in Crete. What's that mean? That means that Paul was with him there. At some point, Paul was with him. And Paul, when he left, he said, you got to, I need you to stay here. So he leaves Titus here. That speaks of Titus, whom we've already talked about in the introductory material. He's a, he's a, he is a great man of God, a great co-worker for the gospel. And, and, he, and he has the full confidence of Paul. Paul, Paul had very little negative that I, I mean, you look at what Paul says about Titus, you don't see a lot. He was a very brave individual. He's a Gentile believer and he wasn't willing to get circumcised. He, he's like, I don't need to be circumcised. I believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not about circumcision. And when he, he was, he was exhibit A when they went down for the Jerusalem council in Acts 15. He, and, he, and he was fine with it. Now, Ty, uh, Timothy, remember, he circumcised Timothy so he wouldn't be an offense to the, the Jews. But, but this, this particular young man, who is a Gentile believer, a child of Paul, is, is a solid believer, and he leaves him there. He leaves him there. And it also indicates the time frame. The, the time frame was following the first imprisonment. He was released from the first impr- imprisonment, and... Paul went to Crete with Titus to establish the gospel there. He he chose to go there. Well, when he leaves, he leaves, but there's work that needs to be completed. And so he looks at at, at Titus and said, I need you to step up here. I need you to do this. This is what I want you to do. You stay and you're going to appoint elders. Let's, Let's move on. That's point two. He says, for this reason, and what he says is to set in order what remains. So we weren't able to get everything done. There was still work to be done that needed to be completed as it related to the church. What was that? Well, what we learn here is that the church needs leaders. It needs organization. It needs People appointed to lead in the body, in the local churches. And that's, that's what he's basically, he says, has to be done here. Number one is organization, appoint elders. Two, the second part of the work is to silence the opposition. Rein in these false teachers, call them for what they are, and, and, and let's silence the opposition. And then un- instruction, thirdly, instruction or to instruct on the relationship in keeping with the theme of doctrine or truth and conduct. How the Word of God embraced and realized is meant to change how we move and operate and and live our lives with each other and outside of the walls. We're promoting good deeds. We're different. You know, we're, we're, we are a peculiar people, not because we dress a certain way. I mean, that that that... That happens too, uh, where, you, you know, you, you used to be back in the day, missionaries would be getting ties that were so outdated, and then they'd come back to the States and they'd stand up. And I'm, I'd be looking at him like, man, he's a peculiar guy. Well, what I realized is we were sending him all our junk overseas, and he'd wear what he thought was in fashion, come back here, and he's like 25 years behind the tie. That went out a long time ago, and they look peculiar. But we're peculiar because of God. Who he made us to be. And, and we need to be uniquely who we are. And that's being good, uh, promoting good work, good deeds, a relationship between truth and error. The third point here that I wanted to, uh, observation, is the task of priority that he left with Titus. He said, I'm leaving you here. It's for this reason, okay? We need to, we need to do these things. And the task of priority was to appoint elders. Okay? Presbyteros 
is the term. But also in this text is the other term that's used as well. But they're interchangeable uh, terms. Point elders, the task of priority is the point elders. Understand something. Did he say point an elder? No. What did he say? Elders. That's plurality. There's a plurality. He's supposed to be promoted, appointing or seeing to it that there's a plurality of elders in, in, the, in the churches. And he's to do so where? In every city. What's that mean? Everywhere there's a church, everywhere there's the church of the Lord, then there ought to be leaders. There ought to be elders, a plurality. There shouldn't be just one guy. To be a plurality of elders. I'm a pastor here, but the reality is, is Milo's a pastor here. If he's an elder, anybody who's an elder is a shepherd. He's, he is that. That's what he is. So Paul, God's slave, which he called himself, he called himself Christ's apostle, leaves Titus here on the island of Crete, where they have been ministering now for some time, and he leaves him to set in order what remains. First on the list, I need you to appoint elders. I need you to appoint elders. So what do we have? Paul is delegating responsibility. This is powerful stuff because he's delegating responsibility to Titus, and he's saying, you're up to the task. This is a big thing he's asking of him. I think it's huge. I mean, you, you cut me loose and tell me to go appoint an elders. That's a huge thing. Think about it. You're supposed to go and appoint elders in every city where the church of the Lord, where there's a, a church. That's a big task. So he's delegating responsibility to Titus. And by sending this letter, he establishes his authority to do that. Because I'm going to tell you, if you walked in here... And we had no elders. We were just starting up. And some guy walked in here out of nowhere and started appointing elders. What would you do? You'd, we'd run him out of here. But if he comes with a letter from Paul that says, I'm leaving you in Crete, and people can see I'm leaving you in Crete for the purpose of this, what does the church do? Oh, it's from Paul. <laughs> cool. Let's do this. Let's get this thing going. This is what the Apostle Paul says we need to have in place, you're going to do it. So this is what's happening with this. How did he appoint the elders? A lot of people want to debate this thing. And you, can, you can't really make hay out of this. Uh, because a lot of people make an issue of, of elder rule versus congregational rule. Okay, Most of us try to strike a balance in this. The reality is, is that the established church... When the church is established, when you have enough people, you ought to have elders. And those elders should exercise oversight, not lording it over. We learned that from Peter. Five, don't lord it over them. Lead them. Lead. But the reality is, we, we, we're more of a pastoral rule but yet we have a congregational voice. The reality is, is that we really can't, we couldn't, Milo could not, and I couldn't just sit down and say, okay, we're plugging him and him in it because they're yes men. And they couldn't do whatever we wanted to do or whatever. No, we would, we would, we as the, the, as elders are entrusted with oversight. Congregation will make decisions that they, or uh, suggest we want to do this or that. And as long as it advances the work of the Lord and, and doesn't go uh, contrary to the word of God or whatever, we're open. We'll, we'll, we can move. We work with that. But it, 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 there is, I'm going to tell you, there isn't anything that's going to get past us or happen without us knowing about it. And that you can say, well, that's micromanaging. Well, I didn't tell you how to tie your shoes this morning. I could care less or what to wear. As long as, you know, I mean, we, we, we know what the Lord says, modesty, those kind of things. But what I'm saying is, is when he was left to appoint him, if you look at it, look at what it says there, how, how Paul said this. For the reason, this reason I left you and I emphasize you. I left you in Crete that you should set in order what remains and appoint elders... In every city, as I directed 
You. So as it related to Titus, who's a pastor, he's given the authority to do this. How did he, did he bypass the congregations in each of these cities? I really doubt that. It was probably like Acts, kind of, with the deacons, where they said, select, you know, seven godly men of, of good character, good reputation. And then, then ultimately, I'm going to tell you, Titus had the vote, the vote on it. But I, I don't want to belabor it. I'm just telling you, the elders need to be there. And in, in local churches that are established and you have a good core, you have elders, then, then that's how the spiritual side of things, they ought, to, they ought to exercise full oversight over the body, take care of the body. But, but it's, not, it's not like they're in and of themselves. We work together because the scriptures also tell us that we ought to submit ye one to another. And that, that, that includes all of us. There should be that countenance, not a lord, lord it over them type deal. But God's ordained plan for the local church is that they have a plurality of leadership, men to lead, and as we'll see, not just any men, but men of character. That's what, all, the, what we ought to look for. That's what we ought to have. So let's look now at the first battery. We've covered the commission We've looked at the call of Titus. This is what you're. This is why I'm leaving you here. This is what needs to happen. What we learn as a church, a New Testament church, we learn that we ought to have a plurality of elders, and they ought to be men that of of good character. What's that look like? Battery number one: domestic qualifications. Look at verse six. Namely, as I directed you, namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. Now, at the outset, I want to say this. There is a general qualification that is set forth, which is repeated in verse 7. Look at verse 7. The overseer must be what? Above reproach. Two different times above reproach is used. I, my, my take on that is this qualification of being above reproach is, is basically uh, an encompassing of the whole of 14 other qualifications or other character marks that ought to be there. That, that ought to be the character of the person you're looking at. So... He needs to be above reproach. Let's talk about that just briefly. Above reproach, what does that mean? What does it mean to be above reproach? Well, obviously, Pastor, it, doesn't, it means that you're not a, uh, reproachable. Well, yeah, that's right. <laughs> if you understand what that means. And what it, what it literally means is that they need to have a life quality, a consistent quality of life, character, behavior, that cannot be taken hold of, laid hold of. What I mean is, not in the, the positive, but on a negative side, that they're living in such way that accusation can be made, but not only made, but stick. They need to be living. The, the, the overriding, and, and we'll get to this, because I'm going to tell you, most people read these, and I did the same thing. I'm like, I'll never be a pastor. I'll never be an elder. Who is this? Who is this all the time? You're not. But the reality is, is it ought to be the bulk of the time. And when you fail in any of them, it ought to be something that concerns you. That bothers me that I'm not measuring up here. And I need to do what I have to do in the Lord, for the Lord, by the Lord's empowerment to make changes in my life. That, that help me to be what I need to be if I'm, being, if I'm an elder. And so we have to keep those things in, in mind. But the idea, literally, the word means not to be laid hold of, that above reproach. It's one against whom it is impossible to bring a charge that would stand up under impartial examination. That's what we're talking about, being above reproach. Unassailable is another way you could say it. That, that, you know, and there are guys like that, <laughs> that you just can't, you can't, you can't put it. But I think every person you could point at an instance where it's occurred. But here's the thing. 
Character is not defined by one, one moment the, on, the, on the positive side or the negative side. It's the ongoing thing. If, if I'm honest all, my, all the time and I have a whole reputation of honesty and, I, and I, I mess up and I'm deceitful one time, that can really damage me if I per- continue in it. But if I acknowledge it, confess it, deal with it, with the person I've wronged and with the Lord, then that does not have to mark me long term. What marks me long term is when I accept the failing and continue in it. And then what happens? That's my character. That, that's who I am now. That's, that, that's what people, I'm assailable. You get it? They can lay hold of that and say, no, nah, that didn't happen one time. <laughs> no, remember Bonnie over here? And remember Jim over here? And how you, you took advantage of those? And then, then I got Betty over here telling me you just tried this last Wednesday with her trying to take advantage of, a, uh, of them financially or whatever the, end, whatever the occurrence. That's what we're talking about. Then you can lay hold of that. Unassailable. Not there won't be, like I said, attacks. They're going to come. You can be assailed even, but they won't stick. It is not, as I stated, it is not a perfection issue. No man can possess these in absolute perfection other than our Lord Jesus, who is the head shepherd. He is all these things in absolute perfection. And that's why he's the chief. That's why he is the head shepherd. And we're all under shepherds under him. But anyhow, let's look at the domestic qualifications, okay? We dealt with uh, above reproach as an uh, uh, over, overriding umbrella, if you will, over all the qualities. I believe they encompass them. If you were to say one thing about an elder and you wanted to put them all in a nutshell of what's said, he's above reproach. And then you could say, well, what does that mean? He's this, all of these other qualities. He doesn't do these things. He doesn't do that. He is this, he is that. That's what we want. So let's look at this, though, because these, these first ones, and some people, I'm telling you, there's books written on, this, on these. Uh, they're, they're, I mean, literally, wars fought, churches split, people sitting on, on the sidelines that ought to be serving the Lord because the, the, these qualifications are not understood properly. And the one that we're going to deal with here right out of the gate, if you look at what he says here, look at the, net, the very first one, above reproach, and then here it is, the husband of one wife. That one there, there I wrote my senior thesis on uh, uh, remarriage, uh, divorce, remarriage, and the church. That was my senior thesis in Bible college. And I wrote, and, and many other guys did too. Some of them reached totally different conclusions than me, but I got to tell you, they were wrong. Because <laughs> they were. They were wrong. Because uh, there is a right understanding of this. And we got to be really careful because I'm going to tell you, a lot of people are sitting on the sidelines who've gone through divorces, widowed, just wrong understanding of this passage to where they never get an opportunity to serve. Now, most churches have turned corners, but not necessarily because they understand the passage, but because they don't really care what it says. And that's a sad reality, too. But the fact is, is if you understand it properly, this isn't... Uh, it, you, 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 people can be used even if they go through terrible things. So let's look at this just real quick, because there's five different views. The Greek literally reads one, a one-woman man. That's how the language reads. It, it's not the husband of one wife, uh, uh, one woman. It is a one-woman man. The elder is a one-woman man. Now, there's five different views as how, that, as how we ought to, ought to take this, okay? Okay. One view is, is they've never engaged in immorality. One, one woman, they've never committed adultery, they've never been uh, unfaithful in any way. And, and I would say, amen, that's great. That's what I want in my elders. You know, if, 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 but that's not what's here. That's not what this is saying. Although it is a good thing. Second one is prohibition against polygamy. You can't have more than one wife. 
One woman man. You, you get one. <laughs> one woman. And that's all you need. That's it. That is not what it says, though. That, 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 that is not the intended uh, totality of what's here. Should a guy be married to one woman? That's exactly what God intends. That should be the case. Third view is no remarried person. It says that he's, a, he's a husband of one wife. That means that if you've been widowed and you remarry, you're disqualified from eldership. Now, I don't know about you, but to me that doesn't make sense at all. Because some people are remarried. Let's just say the wife died. I mean, God even tells us that if, if uh, you don't have the gift of, of celibacy or being single, he said, get married. Get married. It's better to be married than to burn and to have to deal with the desire for, for uh, physical affection and, and the, uh, the camaraderie and companionship of a wife. Get married. So that one doesn't make sense too. But, but there's a lot of people hold that. No remarried person. You come in in some churches and you put, I, I, you know, I, 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 re, I remarried, da, da, da. Well, they, they don't even look at you. Like I said, it's, it's getting further and fewer between. Now here's the other one. Must be married. They have to be the husband of one woman, one wife. They have to be a married person. A lot of people make that case because they say, well, how can an elder, how can you pastor if you, how do you pastor married people if you're not married? And how do you speak on that matter? Well, that's, that's just crazy in and of itself because uh, you, can, you can make cases for the, 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 these guys, uh, even the apostles, were they all married? You know, I mean, what, how were they used? We don't know all their history. We don't know all of it. It just doesn't make sense that it would be must be married. And, and a problem with that is, is how it reads. It's not the indefinite article. It would be uh, rather than one. Let me read that. Let me see if I can say it for you so where you can see it here. It says, uh, the husband of one wife, uh, not the husband of a wife. See, if it was making a, a requirement that you had to be married, you have to be the husband of a wife. Then we, in our culture, that could mean a lot of things because of, of, of what we see going on uh, with gender and everything else. You could make hay that way. But the, the idea is there's a problem with it. Now, let's just get to what it says. And this is the fifth view. And I'm going to just be honest with you. This is where I land. This is where I'm at. He's a one-woman man. He's a one woman man. And what, what that, the idea behind that is if he is married, if he's a married man, he must be one who is completely faithful to his wife. That's my wife. And only is she my wife. And my, my loyalty, my affection, my, in every arena, is with that woman. That's, that's my wife. That's a one woman man. He's not a flirt. He's not promiscuous. Crossing the lines. He doesn't do those things. You can't, you can't take hold of him. You understand? Above reproach, you can't lay hold of that person and say, man, that guy is... Too friendly with all the women. It needs to be clear that he loves his wife. Everybody knows it. Who, who's Pastor Eretta? <laughs> they ought to go together. Stan and Eretta. I think of Mark's parents. I, I think of Roger and Joanne. Joanne and Roger. I've rarely said their names without putting them together. Milo and Cindy. <laughs> it's just the way it goes. I know who you're with. Why? Because that's I know that. But that but especially in leadership. That's why we I've, we've always cautioned about 
always being too huggy. I, I'm a hugger. But I like to hug right out in the foyer. I don't like to hug women, even though I love them and they're my sisters. I don't like to hug them in, in, even in, in where there's not a pe- people in view. If I'm going to hug a gal, usually I'll, I'll hug one of my sisters in the Lord in the foyer and it'll be a hug. You know, or whatever. But I'm not calling them sweetheart, honey, babe, or none of that. I'm saying I'm, I'm praying for you. I love you in the Lord and God's good and we're, you know, it's just a quick hug. But you got to be careful with that. Because I've known people who are just sugary and syrupy with every woman in the church and you're sitting there and I've had it happen where, where other guys see that and they're not really solid in the Lord and they're sitting there, what is up with that guy? I thought he was an elder. I'm like, he is. He just loves everybody. <laughs> He's like, yeah, the girls more than the boys. But, but no, you've got to be above reproach. So you've got to be careful. It needs to be the character quality. That it's very clear that that guy, if he's married, is committed to one woman. And his loyalties in all areas are with her. And that's, that's really what's here. Now, I, I, I would reference you to a paper. You could read mine even. But mine doesn't really sit down. There's a, there's a senior thesis written at Grand Rapids School of the Bible and Music by Pastor David E. Thompson. And he, his entire paper was written on that phrase, the, a one-woman man. And he, he traces the whole argument. It's very well done. And, he, and it, 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 he just did a really scholarly work on that. And it's very well, very well done. And I know there's a lot of people who would say, no, no, no. You know, it's talking about you can never be divorced. You can, you know, all this stuff. That's not what's here. That's not what's here. And, and by the way, if you wanted to talk to me about any of those matters, how that works, because every case is different. It is. I mean, why things happen in marriages You can't just throw down a gauntlet and say everybody falls prey to this hard rule, even if your circumstances are you love you're sitting there loving the Lord and walking with God, and your spouse goes off and and commits adultery and the marriage breaks down. Now I'm shelved for the rest of my life for being used of the Lord. That's that's not that's not God. There's grace. And, and, and by the way, Jesus said, except for in, uh, adultery, except for adultery, you put them away on, on those grounds. And then he goes on to say, he goes on to say that you can remarry. It is an option. If that's the case, you're free. You're not under obligation if that's the case, if you're the, on the innocent side of that thing. So anyway... That's what we're dealing with on that point. So husband of one wife. I hope I didn't overly confuse you. Secondly, children who believe. This one here blows a lot of people up as well. This is not a mandate that an elder must have children, but rather that if he does have children, they are to be believing. Now, that's where the debate starts. Some would say it means you got to have children. They add that in there because he talks about believing children. Well, the issue is, is if you have them, they need to be believing. Now, what do we do with that? Well, the, the, the word is, is pista in, in, in the Greek, and that's where we get believe. Uh, the idea is faithful or believing. Both of those have textual support. You could make a case that they need to be believers, the children. Or they need to be faithful. Now let me uh, me unravel a little bit. However, you need to understand, and we all know this, one can only know the profession of faith. We cannot know the reality of possession. So to say that the requirement is to have children who are believing and say that they have to be saved, I don't, I mean, I don't even know if mine are saved. I want to believe they're saved. They've all made a profession. 
and the fruit in their life, I believe they're believers, I would go to bat and say, yeah, my kids are saved. But only God knows that in them. And, and the, whole, you know, the Holy Spirit bearing witness in their own heart, they know that. So we know that, but we can't know it for certainty as a requirement. That, I think that's pushing it too far. The qualifying clauses that are used here, children who believed, believe not accused of dissipation or rebellion, they give us more clarity as to what is here. It seems to indicate that the control of the children is in view. Children who are faithful. Now you say, well, we, I don't know about that. Well, just flip back to 1 Timothy. You don't have to go very far. 1 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse 4. He's talking about qualifications as well. Overseers and deacon. He must be one, talking about elders, who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. So what's the issue where he talks to Timothy about that? Control. Are your children yielded to your authority in your home? That seems to be the more uh, clear and best way to take this. Not just save, because I can't really know that. I, I want them to be, you know. I mean, we all want our kids to be. But to lay it down as a requirement, well, how do, uh, then we got to have a litmus test. And the litmus test, the only one we can really put on them is, have you trusted Christ? Well, yeah, I've trusted Christ. But they're living like the devil. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Now am I qualified? But hey, my kid's saved. He says he's saved. But he's out here tearing up the town every night. Which would you rather have? I'd rather have the kid sitting there and he's going to do what dad says no matter whether he's saved or not. <laughs> he's, going to, he's going to be subject to his authority and he's going to come to Christ as God brings him to himself. But while he's in my home, he's under my charge. But even more than that, he's to be yielded to my authority. He's, he's to be respectful of, of my authority. Ruling your own, how can you, well, the, the one phrase is, is, how can you rule over the house of God if you can't rule your own? If you can't be a, 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 what you need to be in your own home. So, so that seems to be the idea. Like I said, the qualifying clauses and then 1 Timothy give clarity. Dissipation, not guilty of dissipation. Uh, it's a term that means debauchery or dissipation, but the idea of dissipation is self-indulgent and wasteful in their manner of life. A good example biblically would be the prodigal son. He went out and wasted all of his inheritance. Just That's dissipation. He just went out and just gone. Then rebellion, we all know what rebellion is. Refusal to yield to authority. But the point here is this. The elder must have control of those in they're charged domestically. They're, they, they need to be respected. He must be a proper father whose children will yield to his voice, his authority. They'll yield. Uh, I will say this, and, and I esteem this man. Everybody knows what I think of Pastor Storm. Pastor Storm went through a season with a wayward child, and she wouldn't care. He only had one daughter, so I put it out there and put she, uh, that pronoun, you know exactly who if you know his children. But he had one that was wayward, and she got into some really uh, tough situations, and it really created problems for him, and she was yet a minor. He was yet a minor in his home. And I'll never forget it. He, he, he came before the church. And this I'm, I'm coming in after he did all this. I'm getting all this secondhand. And it still makes me emotional to think about it. He stood before his flock and, and said, I'm, I'm going to step down because I have a child who will not yield to my authority, basically. And the church said, no, no. <laughs> they didn't let him. But he was willing. He understood what, what this means. It's an important thing. The church recognized that he was doing everything he could. See, he wasn't just... 
Because I've seen that happen with pastors, by the way, who are just like, I, you know, it is what it is, and everybody's supposed to live with it. Well, it, it besmirches, it makes the church assailable. You understand? We're not above reproach, not only individually this leader, but the whole church now has to bear this. But because he was willing to do what he was willing to do, and he was doing everything he could to rein in the situation, the church is like, we can't put any more upon you, any more of an expectation. And so that they, he didn't end up having to leave. He didn't leave. And by the way, she's sold out totally for the Lord Jesus Christ. Loves the Lord. Loves God's people. Ministers for the Lord. Witnesses for the Lord. She turned around. She was her dad's closest companion in his last years as Alzheimer's took his entire mind when he didn't even know who she was. She was the one by her dad's side. So God turned her around. And I, I believe that's an, uh, it goes right back to Proverbs. You train up a child in the way they shall go, should go. And when they're old, they will not depart from it. They'll come back to it. And she did. She did. But I, I just wanted to share that because you have to be at that place. If you can't rule your house well, then you shouldn't be, you, you, or your family doesn't respect you. You're, you're not at a place to be in that capacity. You just can't. You can't do it. Uh, you know, I, 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 God forbid it ever happens to me. I, 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 don't, I would probably do the same thing because I was taught that way. So stay in line, so. <laughs> Sophia. Cole's grown. Mariah's grown. They love the Lord. And, and, but it, it's an issue. It can be an issue. But why these qualifications? Uh, why these qualifications? Here's why. It speaks of one's character. It speaks of who they are. Who, who they are. Who the person is. That's why he says this. So how important is character? Listen, we're God's stewards. We're God's stewards. And this isn't meant to scare anybody away because we're told that if you desire to be an elder, you desire a good thing. But understand that we have to be people and that, that are concerned with our reputation, our character. It's got to matter. It, it speaks of who we are. We're God's stewards, we're His under-shepherds, and those people who serve in those capacities need to be above reproach as to their character. They, you can't lay it on them and, and keep it there. So proper leadership, what we're going to get, and we're going to cover the next batteries the next time, but proper leadership is essential in reaching the corporate and individual goal of promoting good deeds, glorifying God, and silencing the opposition. I want to say this. Do you understand when you look at that theme why you got to have leaders of character? How do, how do you make that happen? If the goal is promoting good deeds, when your elders, if, they're, if they don't, are not men of character and they're leading the body. I'm going to tell you what happens. They point at you and say, well, you don't do that. Why should I do that? That's not what I see you do. That's not what I see in you. And then what's it do as far as the opposition? We'll get to that next time. But the reality is they love it. When, they, when, when a church crumbles from the top down. Why is that? Because you put the, those are your leaders. Those are the leaders. So it, it needs to matter. We, shouldn't, we, we should be very careful as people and understand how important it is. I'm not saying they're special. They're not. They're called of God. They're in, but the reality is, is that we need, it, it needs to be a matter of concern. There are cult, I'm telling you, within the church culture today, there are things that elders are, are they do and are about and doing and, and, 
Years ago, you'd have never heard of it. And I'm telling you, it speaks to character. How important is character? I don't know. How important is the person and who they are? Because that's what character is. It matters. And it matters with the Lord. And it matters with those who serve in His church. Let's pray together. Lord, we love You. We thank You for Your Word and the instruction we receive. Lord, uh, sometimes it can be brutal. And it can tear up hearts. And, but my prayer is that it doesn't do that, but it moves us to better people. And uh, people who listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking through your truth. And that we'd be willing to make the changes. Lord, I pray for our church and for the men of our church. And that there would be elders, uh, that people who desire to serve as elders. And their lives reflect that, that, that character. That's who they are. And that they can step into that, that place as those positions open and, and are, are need of filling. And I'm thankful for those that already serve and have served, Lord, that have lived and, and conducted themselves in keeping with these qualifications or at least striven to do so ongoingly. But we realize it's your church, Lord, and you make the call and we want to be the best we can be for you that you get the glory, that we do silence the opposition as, as individuals and as a corporate body. But bless each one for being out today. Bless any fellowship we might enjoy one with another. Uh, keep us safe throughout the week ahead. Bless our VBS time, Lord, as next week is blocked out for that ministry to the young people of our community. We pray it would be well attended. We pray as well that we might even see young souls come to the saving knowledge of Christ. But may it be a great time of ministering together and the lives of, of our young people in the community and even their parents this week, Lord. And I pray for the preparations tonight as we gather back here to decorate. May that all go well. And may our time of fellowship this evening be blessed as well, Lord. But thank you for each one who's out. Uh, go before them and use each one of us for your glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.